All of a sudden the room goes silent. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you for coming out tonight. On Saint, I see green St. Patrick's Day. I have my green coat on. So um, thank you for coming out on St. Patrick's Day. Uh, and welcome to the College of St. Benedict and uh, to St. John's University as well if you are not a student or a faculty member or uh, um, someone who's here all the time like the rest of us. Um, here's what I'm going to do uh, just to start out. I want to first thank a few people, um, say a few words about the Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar Program, and then introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Alexander Field. Um, I'm Lewis Johnston, and I have the privilege of holding the Joseph Ferry Professorship in the McCarthy Center here at College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. And tonight's uh, event is co-sponsored by the McCarthy Center and by Phi Beta Kappa, our Theta chapter of Minnesota. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, first, though, I want to make some really special thank yous. First of all, the president's offices at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University have been a tremendous help. The Phi Beta Kappa Theta of Minnesota chapter, the McCarthy Center, of course, uh, but especially one person, Stacy Pink, who's back there, and everybody should applaud for doing all this work. Amazing. <laughs> and then the staff of the Goretzky Center as well for setting things up and putting things together so nicely for us. We appreciate that. Um, second, let me tell you a little bit about the Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar Program. Um, since 1956, the Phi Beta Kappa Society's Visiting Scholar Program has been offering undergraduates the opportunity to spend time with some of America's most distinguished scholars. The purpose of the program is to contribute to the intellectual life of the institution by making possible an exchange of ideas between visiting scholars and the resident faculty and students. The 13 men and women participating during the 2013-2014 year will visit 100 colleges and universities with chapters of Phi Beta Kappa, spending two days on each campus and taking full part in the academic life of the institution. They'll meet informally with students and faculty members, participate in classroom discussions and seminars, and give a public lecture, like tonight, open to the entire community. The program is now entering its 58th year, and the visiting scholar has sent 611 scholars on 5,004 two-day visits, according to the national office. So that's a lot of visits and a lot of scholars. We have one in particular tonight, so let me introduce our visiting scholar, Dr. Alexander Field. Um, I forgot to ask you a question, which is, you're the Mi Michael and Mary... Michelle. Michelle and Mary... Oradre. Oradre Professor of Economics at Santa Clara University. See, this is why you're supposed to do this in advance, and I didn't, so... My daughter asked me, did they name everything? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, he was executive director of the Economic History Association from 2004 to 2012. He served as associate editor of the Journal of Economic Literature and editor of Research in Economic History. If you're a student, you don't understand probably how important that is. That's one of the critical functions in academia is working in these journals and refereeing and making sure that scholars interact with one another in their publication. And like many jobs in life, it can sometimes be thankless. And so. To me, that's a real great thing that Dr. Field did that. Uh, before coming to Santa Clara University, he had been a professor at Stanford. He earned his undergraduate degree at Harvard, his master's at the L London School of Economics, and his PhD at a place called the University of California at Berkeley. Those of you who know me know why I said that. Um, his current research centers on the United States macroeconomic history with an emphasis on technology and productivity and is reflected in his most recent book, which he's going to be talking about tonight, A Great Leap Forward, 1930s Depression and U.S. Economic Growth. Let me just point out that this was chosen as an outstanding academic title by Choice, which is the American Library Association. It won the Alice Hansen Jones Prize for the best book in American economic history at the Economic History Association. And though this is a Benedictine institution, I'll also point out that he won the Alpha Sigma Nu National Book Award among the Jesuit scholars. So, you know, we're ecumenical, right? Um, <laughs> he's also the author of Altruistically Inclined, The Behavioral Sciences, Evolutionary Theory, and the Origins of Reciprocity, in which he seeks to explain the origin of human altruism through the integration of the human sciences. And his research has been supported by grants and fellowships from the National Science Foundation and the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. 
Finally, on a personal note, I first got to know Alex back in the late 1980s when I was a graduate student at the University of California at Berkeley. And two things impressed me then and shined through in both his work and during the visit. Um, the first one, which you're going to see tonight, is the care with which he takes, the, the care he takes with getting the numbers and the story right. If you read about a story or a statistic or a data series in Alex's work, my attitude is you can take that to the bank. It is right because he's so careful with his work. The second one, which you'll also experience tonight, is the kindness with which Alex treats students. Um, I was a graduate student who asked probably impertinent questions, and I remember you still being kind to me then, and as a young scholar, he was extremely thoughtful with comments as an editor, um, even though one paper you didn't accept. That's all right. Um, <laughs> I don't hold it against you. Um, but watching Alex today, it's clear that he really is a true scholar and a teacher. So join me in welcoming Alex Field to the podium. I would like to begin by thanking everyone at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University for the hospitality uh, that I've experienced here. It's, there have been some wonderful surprises visiting, a camp, visiting campuses that I didn't know too much about. Uh, a special thanks to Professor Hemeseth for coming tonight and to Lewis Johnston for organizing these details and to Stacy Pank who's at work on details I really appreciate and to Kevin who drove me from the airport and to many of the others here if I could remember your names I would thank you for our, our stimulating conversations. So um, let me um, I'm just gonna take out my take off my watch here so I don't to get carried away too much. Uh, what I am going to talk about is uh, a book that I published uh, about uh, three years ago with Yale University Press. It's called uh, A Great Leap Forward, 1930s Depression and U.S. Economic Growth. And I'm going to begin with a picture of the cover. And this is a picture taken at the 1939-40 uh, General Motors Futurama exhibit at the New York World's Fair. This was the most popular exhibit at that, uh, at that fair. And what they're doing is they're looking at a model of what they, futurists at the time, think the U.S. economy is going to look like in 1960. Uh, there are these moving cars moving along controlled access freeways. There are highways, there's suburbs, and so on. They didn't get everything right, but they got an awful lot of it right, at least in compared to some other uh, futuristic uh, predictions. And um, so I want to ask the question, why are they looking so intently? And if you look, maybe this is almost a visual pun on the cover. It looks like they're almost about ready to leap off their seats in terms of a great leap forward. The, the, the seats actually rotate around the diorama. That was the way the thing was set up. There were motorized seats. And so the question is, why are they looking so intently? And my answer is that in spite of the hardships of the Depression, they have, over the prior decade, witnessed spectacular improvements in technological and organizational knowledge, which has already translated into significant improvements in living standards. And they're looking forward with great anticipation to what the next two decades may bring. And so this is the central argument of the book. And that is that behind the backdrop of double-digit unemployment, which extended for more than a decade, potential output full employment output, potential output, grew by leaps and bounds over this period. And it was this growth and potential that helped make possible the successful prosecution of the Second War, Second World War, and the golden age of American living standard improvements between 18, 1948 and 1973, which was roughly the period in which I grew up. Uh, probably the first person, I'll just divert, take a little bit of an excursion here, the first person who realized this was Simon Kuznets, the father of national income accounting, because uh, at the time of the Japanese attack on the United States, he was tasked basically with trying to estimate the potential output of the United States because the military was determined that we would not fight a war of attrition of the trench warfare as we had during the First World War. They knew it was going to be much more mechanized war and they had to make an estimate of you know how many divisions can we put in the field, 
uh, how many tanks can we produce, how many airplanes we can produce, how much are we prepared to try to suppress consumption. They know they're going to put a lot of people in uniform. How many women can we draw into the labor force? You know, how much slack is there in terms of the existing unemployment, which was still close to 10% in 1941. And when he came back with those numbers, they were much higher than he expected or indeed anyone in the administration or the military had expected. And once the word got out, all the military started doubling and tripling their demands for divisions and for aircraft and for tanks. And Kuznets and a couple of other planners, Robert Nathan and also somebody I knew at Stanford, Mo Abramovitz, had to fight a rearguard action then against the military and talk the military down from these targets, because had we attempted to meet them, we would have ended up with Soviet-style results, which was, you know, a thousand tanks, but only 300 have ball bearings, so the rest are just rusting. So I actually think that uh, uh, Kuznets, uh, you know, is, deserves a major role in terms of our success during the Second World War. But anyway, potential output, I think you probably, those of you who are econ students probably understand what we're talking about here. It's how much output can the economy produce given the size, skill, education, training, and experience of its labor force, its physical capital stock, structures, and equipment, and its technological and organizational knowledge, which we can think of as recipes for turning inputs into output. The output gap, of which we are experiencing a significant one right today, we have, we've had a, even though the recession's been over supposedly since 2009, we still have a very substantial gap between actual and potential. Uh, and that's the output gap is the difference between actual and potential. And of course, it varies closely with the unemployment rate. As the unemployment rate falls back towards, you know, 5% perhaps or 4.5%, the output gap will narrow. So this is just a long-run picture. You can't see the scale at the bottom taken, take, bottom, taken straight from a textbook. Uh, of the, uh, the black line is uh, the trend growth rate, which is the estimate of natural real GDP. Uh, it's inflation adjusted, and then you see actual real GDP is the red line, and of course you see all of this area. Oops, sorry. Okay, all of that. I'll just won't try to point anyway. This is all the lost output associated with the Great Depression, somewhere between two and a half and three years of average potential output down the tubes during that period, uh, and this is a logarithmic scale. Uh, as you know, most time series economists work with logarithms because it means the continuously compounded growth rate will be proportional to the slope. So what that roughly constant slope of that uh, black line is showing that for a century, and indeed going all the way back to the Civil War, the long-run growth rate of the U.S. economy has just been a tad over 3%. It's been remarkably constant, although the contribution of technological change and input growth has varied over those different periods. And in the bottom panel, you can see the unemployment rate varying inversely with the output gap uh, peaking here. These are the Lieber got numbers at 25% in 1933, uh, dropping to 15% in the recovery in 37, and then back up to 19% in uh, 38. And then it was really, in a sense, the, the, the war did close the output gap. Uh, with because of the massive uh, fiscal and monetary stimulus associated with it. All right. In terms of standard views of the Depression, I think it's fair to say that it is the output gap and the high unemployment that have dominated our thinking about the 1930s. Uh, so here are some images of that uh, decade that I, I think uh, come, to come to mind. First of all, here are people milling around in the financial district of New York at the time of the 1929 stock market crash. Here we have people outside a bank. This is a, we did not have federal deposit insurance at that point, so one of the features of the years between 1929 and 33 was the failure of thousands of banks. Uh, if people got wind that the uh, asset side of their bank was full of loans that were not going to perform, uh, they wanted to get in ahead of other creditors, other depositors, get their money out first. You can think of Jimmy Stewart in, a wonder, in It's a Wonderful Life in terms of that image. Uh, and so this was, uh, this, was, this was a feature of the Great Depression. Here you have unemployed workers at a job bank, desperate for some work during the Great Depression. Uh, again, people lining up for free coffee and donuts for the unemployed. Uh, soup kitchen, proverbial picture of uh, you know, down and out people during the Great Depression. 
and uh, perhaps most poignant, a, a Hooverville. They were, as they were described after our, the president at the time, these were shanty towns that emerged outside of uh, most major American and some uh, minor American cities. I think this might have been Omaha, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, and then, of course, we have Steinbeck and the Grapes of Wrath. We have uh, farmers from Oklahoma fleeing the Dust Bowl, uh, trying to make their way in their uh, Model T's or Model A's to California, the border of California, where they'll, where they'll be met with signs telling them to go home. I said, I don't want to trivialize or downplay any of this. Bank failures and financial crisis were associated with a 75% decline in real gross private domestic, that's spending investment, that's spending on plant and equipment between 1929 and 1933. The Dow Jones Industrial Index dropped 89% from peak to trough. Of course, you did have deflation, about 8% a year between 1929 and 1933. So that in real terms, it dropped 60%, but that's still a very substantial loss of household wealth. Real gross domestic product dropped close to 30%, and unemployment rose from 3.2% in 1929 to 25% in 1933. So you have to keep that in perspective in thinking about uh, what's happened in the last, in the years uh, since 2008. So double-digit unemployment for more than a decade represented a terrible waste of human and other resources, an untold hardship for the millions of people out of work. So when I spoke about two and a half or three years of output going down the toilet, two and a half or three years of income went down the toilet. Of course, that was differentially experienced by the people who were out of work and you know, large numbers of long-term unemployed as unfortunately we are suffering from today. And yet, and yet, I'm going to argue that the Depression years were a triumph of American ingenuity, inventiveness, and hard work. This was fueled by an explosion of research and development, government infrastructure investment, and in some sectors, but certainly not all, I have to be very careful about that, creative response to adversity. Scientific, technological, and organizational advance expanded the capabilities, the potential output of the economy. This was our great leap forward. It helped us win the war and set the stage for a quarter century of post-war prosperity. It is in part why the United States stood astride the world economy in 1948 like a colossus, and high post-war growth rates in Europe and Japan represented catch-up. Uh, surely wartime destruction was part of that, but the conventional narrative, it seems like throughout the 1930s, it's doom and gloom, doom and gloom, doom and gloom, depression, depression, depression. Then we have a little, you know, more than three years, three and, th and under four years of war, and, you know, much smaller period of full-scale mobilization, and somehow almost magically and mystically, you know, the, the, the United States economy rises like a phoenix from the ashes, and it's 1948 and we dominate the world. And I'm saying no. I'm saying that the basis for, for the technological and organizational and infrastructural basis for post-war prosperity, the 48 to 73 period, the golden age of American living standard improvements, is in place in 1941 and is also why we were so successful in putting 11 million so people in uniform, uh, producing tens of thousands of jeeps, tanks, bombers, and so on, and at least by some standards, in spite of rationing and the unavailability of a number of goods like automobiles and appliances, raising consumption compared to what it had been during the Great Depression. I love this particular poster, or this particular picture, because I think it captures the, 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 the two sides of the Great Depression. You know, if you look at the top, uh, this is propaganda. This is propaganda, but, but like all propaganda, there's a certain element of truth to it. And so it's kind of trumpeting the world's highest standard of living, which the United States probably still experienced at that time. Little slogan, there's no way like the American way. Uh, you have a nice, happy family with a son and a daughter in a late model car. And actually, by 1936, 37, automobile production had come to within 95% of the 1929 levels, although we didn't actually reach it again until 1949. But in the bottom, you see a long line of unemployed uh, black workers looking for uh, relief. OK, so I basically uh, said this. So the problem, as I've seen it, is that economic and cultural studies of the 1930s have focused almost exclusively on the output gap 
and not on the growth of potential output during this period. So you're naturally asking yourselves then, well, how can this be? Why was it that actual and potential output in 1941, uh, why were these so much higher than they had been in 1929? And to try to give a summary of the book, because you know it's not who knows how far I'll get this tonight. We want to have some time for questions. Uh, again, I'll kind of recapitulate the argument. Three tributaries. Number one, the maturing of a privately funded research and development system that had begun with Thomas Edison in Menlo Park, New Jersey, before it was distorted by the demands of the Second World War, the Manhattan Project, and the military industrial complex, and the, 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 through after the war. Number two, spillovers from the government-funded build-out of the surface road network. Now, a spillover is where you have, say, uh, government investment, which then improves productivity or opportunities in the private sector. This is particular val re particularly relevant for the rapidly growing industry of trucking and also complementarity between trucking and railroads and transportation and also had major impacts on wholesale and retail distribution. And then in a few sectors, but by no means all, uh, the kick in the rear of adversity that generated creative responses. I have to be very careful about that because when I started talking about this, people, this was before any of the financial crisis came in, but people would be cynically chuckling and saying, well, you're saying we had the fastest rate of total factor productivity growth during the Great Depression, so what you're saying, chuckle, chuckle, is what we need to boost the long-run growth rate of the economy is a good rip-roaring depression. And I want to make it clear that I'm not saying that. Uh, I think the effect of adversity on economic performance is very similar to the effect of adversity on individuals. If you take 100 individuals at random and subject them to an adverse shock, you know, their spouse gets sick, they lose a child, uh, they lose their job or so on, there's going to be a few of them who will, you know, pull themselves up by their bootstraps and, you know, they'll do something they otherwise never would have and they'll kind of somehow elicit these incredible efforts of creative uh, uh, discovery, and they'll look back on it and describe how they hated it at the time, it was terrible at the time, but how it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened in their life, and then they'll go on the motivational speaker circuit, and so on. <laughs> My point is that for every one of those, there are 19 who sunk into depression and stayed home drinking beer and watching the daytime soaps. And I'm making the same argument with respect to companies. So I do have to qualify that. I've always been very careful. but. There are some sectors where the kick in the rear did lead to rationalization with persisting long-term productivity benefits, and one of them was railroads. Uh, we had, as of the 1880s, we did have a uniform railway gauge in this country, four foot eight and a half inches, that, you know, that we unified, got four time zones, a standard railway gauge in the 1880s, 1890s, but as of 1929, that rail system was being essentially uh, run by uh, 160 class one railroads all privately owned. They'd been taken over during the First World War, but they were back in private ownership now. And so there were big questions and problems about what happens you know, if you're carrying a load of freight into foreign territory. You know, suppose you're a Minnesota railroad headquartered here and you're trying to take a load to San Francisco. Can you run your rolling stock and your locomotive over track owned by the Union Pacific or the Central Pacific? Well, you can, but you've got to negotiate you know, a you know, per, per mile rail amount. What happens if the, your locomotive breaks down in Utah? Can't, will they, are they prepared to fix it there? What happens if you get your load to San Francisco and you offload it, are you allowed to backhaul? In other words, can you pick up a load in a foreign territory, in a sense, stealing cargo from your competitors? Well, if each one of these deals has to be negotiated individually, you can imagine the amount of transactions costs. So uh, uh, basically, under the leadership of a trade association and with probably the turning of the eyes of the antitrust authorities, the railroads negotiated uh, uh, essentially treaties and contracts which allowed for what they described as unlimited freight interchange. In other words, they're just they're standard schedules. You know, it's going to be this much per ton mile. You know, the locomotive firebox breaks down. This is how much it's going to cost to repair it. We're not going to negotiate it each time. It's like going, you know, car breaks down. You take it to the mechanic. He figures out it's the water pump. He doesn't spend a lot of time trying to see whether the bolts on the water pump are rusted and whether this is going to be a long-time job or a short-time job. He just types into the computer. It says, you know, 1.2 hours. He multiplies it by the shop rate, and he says, that's what I'm charging you. Now get out of here and come back in two hours. And, you know, some jobs will take a little less, and some will take a little more. It's just not worth trying to put the time into estimated, and that's kind of the 
It, it were huge productivity gains, though, as a result of that. All right, so these all contributed to an extraordinary growth in productivity. Let me talk about the first one of those tributaries, though, which is the private sector R&D contributions. And by and large, these did not uh, come on a prior found, did not build on a prior foundation of government R&D. Most of the government R&D in the 19th century was in the agricultural sector, with agricultural stations and land grant colleges and so forth. Uh, but the government's contribution to productivity growth, I will argue, during the Great Depression was principally in the area of physical infrastructure. Uh, also, let me also mention that product, about the word productivity, a lot, many of my students make the mistake of using this interchangeably with the word product. And that's, they're not the same things. Productivity has to do not with output, that's what product is, but with the ratio of outputs to inputs. So output grows because inputs grow over time and because their productivity grows. In other words, the efficiency with which the inputs are combined to produce output becomes better with improved technological, scientific, and organizational knowledge. So I'm going to I'll be very quick about this, but I want to give you a brief overview of the fundamental kind of growth accounting methodology that underlies the central finding of the book. If we use capital letters to refer to levels and lowercase letters to refer to rates of growth, I'm going to call Y output, that's like real GDP. K is capital, that's the stock of structures and equipment, and I'm assuming that the service flow is proportional to it. And N is labor, uh, which could be labor number of individuals or labor hours. I'm going to talk about labor hours. If we make that, uh, those assignments, we can decompose the growth of output, which is little y, into the contributions of the growth of la the labor force, that is hours, that's little n, the growth of the physical capital stock, and then a residual, the growth of productivity. This is a solo residual. So the formula basically is that output growth is equal to the sum of productivity growth, and then a weighted average of the growth of capital services here and labor hours over there, with the weights corresponding to the shares of the inputs in a national income. So about 25% on capital, 75% on labor during this period. But it actually, as I'll show you, it turns out those shares don't really matter. So again, we can rearrange things so that the residual or total factor productivity growth is just the difference between output growth and this weighted average of input growth. There are times in history where almost all of the growth in output can be attributed simply to the growth of inputs and there's nothing left over. That's, uh, uh, that's what Abramovitz argued uh, I think somewhat misleadingly about the uh, end of the 19th century, but there are other periods where there's a big gap. Okay, so let me, uh, let, me, let me go on now. As it turns out, the weights on labor hours and capital don't really matter in the Great Depression, and why? And this kind of puts in a nutshell the central empirical founding, finding. In 1941, the number of hours worked in the private non-farm economy, that's about three quarters of the total economy, excludes agriculture and government for reasons that I go into the book, but it's about three fourths of the economy. The total number of labor hours worked in the private sector is virtually identical to what it was in 1929. So the growth rate is zero. You might ask, well, how can that be? Certainly the population and labor force must have been larger. Well, first of all, the depression was a low fertility period. It was secondly a low immigration period. But on top of that, the unemployment rate was still almost 10% in 1941 versus 3.2% in 1929. So however you want to explain it, we're talking about zero growth in hours. What about the capital stock? Well, the value of the capital stock actually declined quite substantially between 1929 and 1933 because gross investment fell so much that there wasn't enough even to compensate for the wear and tear on the structures and equipment that year. So the actual stock was dropping down to 33. Then it began to recover, but by 1941, its value is about up to what it was in 1929. So for practical purposes, we can talk about growth in labor hours is zero, growth in capital stock is zero, but output in 1941 is somewhere between 33 and 40 percent higher than it was in 1929. Why the difference? The 40 percent is using the newer chain index methods. Uh, this is, you know, kind of nerd talk for you really uh, tier three economic students and so on. But the point, if you, if you then kind of convert that back into a continuously compounded growth rate of what we call total factor productivity, we're talking about 
3% per year. This is coming straight out of Kendrick. If I make a cyclical adjustment for the fact that 1941 was not full employment and productivity ha does have a very strong cyclical component, we're about up to 2.8. And if I then redo it with the uh, chain weighted estimates for output, we're at close to 3% for 12 years for TFP growth. And I realize most of you are not understanding what I'm talking about, but the key point is this, the, as I said earlier, the long run growth rate of the, US, of the US economy for since the end of the Civil War has been a little bit over 3%, but that's been the sum of total factor productivity growth and the input growth. So what I'm saying is all of the growth and output during these 12 year period is attributable to technological and organizational change. And if I had more time, I would also show you that means all of the growth of labor productivity, which is output per hour, is due to total factor productivity growth changing because there's no change in the capital labor ratio. Okay, enough technical stuff. So I've gone over this. Okay, so this is just my point to make it kind of simple. If you, doesn't matter how you weight zero and zero, you're still going to get zero. It doesn't matter whether the capital weight is 25% or 33%. So if you just go through that simple algebra, the formula, you know, y equals a plus b beta k plus 1 minus beta n reduces to the growth of output equals the growth of technological and organizational change as picked up in this residual factor. So that's the fundamental finding published in the 2003 American Economic Review article and that's expanded upon in a, in a narrative in the book that extends back to the Civil War and forward to the information technology boom. Now let me talk about tributary one. Uh, this was really remarkable when I came across these numbers. We actually have very good data on the number of research and development workers. This is in manufacturing, but then as now, almost all private sector research and development is done in manufacturing. We have these numbers because the National Research Council surveyed U.S. manufacturers in 1927, 1933, 1940, and 1946. So let's just look at the numbers of people working in R&D workers in manufacturing. We're talking about 1927, 6,300. Fast forward to 1933, that includes the four worst years of the Great Depression. We're close to 11,000. Now seven more years of double-digit unemployment in which the unemployment rate never goes below 15% and we're at 28,000. So I can tell you, and we can see this in some of Bob Margo's microeconomic data, depression were terrible years if you were in construction. But if you were a chemist or an engineer, you had an insurance policy against uh, unemployment. And in fact, in terms of the real standard of living you were enjoying, it were very, very good years indeed. Now the numbers continue to rise during the uh, 40 to 46 period, but actually at a slower rate. And of course, a lot of that is going into the Manhattan Project and other military-related R&D. So rather than ta only talk about you know, numbers and perhaps borrowing a bit from, I can't remember it was the 08 or the 12 campaign of Obama's, I'm going to talk about winning the future in the 1930s to try to cloak those numbers in a, in a more concrete uh, form by talking about three innovators from that period, Wallace Carruthers, Philo T. Farnsworth, and Donald Douglas. So this is Wallace Carruthers, uh, the inventor of nylon. He was a chemistry professor at Harvard. Uh, the DuPont Corporation made him an offer he couldn't refuse and uh, said, you know, you know, move down to, uh, to Delaware. It will give you a lab. We'll give you all the assistance you need. And, uh, you know, he invented, uh, he invented nylon and neoprene, responsible for another, uh, uh, other sorts of, uh, of, of, of tremendous advances in terms of chemical engineering. Uh, he was married on February 21st, 1936. Uh, in February 16th, 1937, uh, DuPont received a patent for nylon and its manufacturing process uh, from the U.S. government. Um, Unfortunately, uh, on April 29, 1937, he had been suffering from depression throughout his life and he checked into a, a Philadelphia hotel and poured some cyanide into a glass of lemonade and killed himself. Apparently, I learned, was it last night, I think, from Professor Olson, is that right? This, no, so, some, Stanford. Stanford, right, Stanford, that he carried this packet around with him. But his daughter was, was born two months later. So it's a very sad story, but not for DuPont, because on May 14, 1940, they rolled out nylon stockings, which what, this was, you know, they sold 63 million pair the first year. This was a, you know, a tremendous, tremendous improvement over silk stockings. And you know, so a few of you will recognize the cultural references, but Joseph Heller wrote this book, Catch-22. Has anybody read that or seen the movie in which nylon stockings were the currency among airmen and GIs and 
A Milo Minderbinder in that novel kind of takes all the nylon from the parachutes and the planes and starts this business. He puts a little share of minder, Milo Minderbinder Enterprises in the parachute. Anyway, you should see the film or read the book. Um, okay, so Philo T. Farnsworth, inventor of the first all-electronic television system. Now, television did not actually have its big commercial success until after the war, but all of the development work was done during the Great Depression, funded by what we would call today venture capital, actually San Francisco venture capital. Um, so what Farnsworth did, his contribution was to dispense with the mechanical Nipkow disks that, it, I'll give you a picture in a moment, that had characterized earlier prototypes. Uh, in 1931, David Sarnoff at RCA tried to essentially do a Carruthers on him by making him an offer he couldn't refuse. They offered to buy all his patents, provided he became an RCA employee, and essentially then from then on, RCA would own the patents. Farnsworth, who was more entrepreneurial than Carruthers, Carruthers was more of an ac academically minded oriented. He declined. There was a decade long patent battle with RCA, whose researchers, Vorekin, claimed priority for the image dissector. RCA ultimately lost that battle, and they had to license the patents from Farnsworth. Uh, okay, so uh, these were patents for TV scanning, focusing, synchronizing contrast, and control devices that formed the underlying basis for the technology of the most successful new, com new product of the post-war period. The commercial televisions and commercial television broadcasting was rolled out at that same 1939-40 New York World's Fair. And TV cameras based on Farnsworth design were used in this country until the early 2000s when they began to be replaced with devices using charged couple devices, CCDs. So this was the Nipkow disk, dates from 1984, 1884. You can see this is an electric motor. There's a series of spiral holes. There's going to be a photoelectric cell behind those spiral, spiral holes. So as the disk rotates, it's going to get a reading in terms of the amount of light that's being registered. That can then be transmitted through the air over radio or through a wire and then reconstituted at the other end. But I think, as you can appreciate, uh, the resolution of these images is going to be pretty poor. And so this is the first RCA TRK-12 television system uh, introduced at the World's Fair in 1939. You can see that the cathode ray tube, a few of you may remember cathode ray tubes. It's what students live out, leave outside their apartments when they're moving out because there's no market for them anywhere anymore. Even the big 32-inch ones, they weigh a ton. Anyway, this is, this is mounted vertically. There's a 45-degree angled mirror at the top, so you look into the mirror and then you see the television uh, you see the television I mean, It looks actually it bears some, some resemblance to those 1970s-style projection television systems with the, you know, the green, red, blue uh, systems. Okay, so here's people visiting. You see now the backs of, a, of several TRK-12s, people going into the RCA pavilion. Uh, they're staring at images of themselves on television, and when they leave the pavilion, they get a little certificate, you know, I was on television at the RCA pavilion. Uh, here's a 1939 Dumont model with a horizontally mounted television set. And here is a photograph of a commercial television transmission from the New York World's Fair showing the Trilon and Perisphere, which were the symbols of the, uh, of the fair. Now, um, let me just say one other point about television. Uh, basically, with the war, everything is like put on hold, and all of that uh, production capability is goes into producing screens for electronic test equipment and ultimately radar screens and so on. So it's really only after the war, but essentially although what happened during the Depression was technologies which had been developed during the 20s were exploited. Some technologies were originated in the 30s and exploited before the war, like nylon, and others essentially were replacing the depleted larder, if you like, uh, which had existed at the start. And that's kind of the nature of what's going on uh, in general and technological change. Let me now finish up by talking about Donald Douglas, uh, designer of the DC-3. Uh, he, he, he left the Naval Academy in 1912 to pursue a career as an aeronautical engineer. In 1914, uh, he completed his bachelor's degree at MIT. He was immediately appointed as an assistant professor. Uh, he left in 1921 to start his own company, building planes for the Army and the post office. In 1930s, he began work on the DC-3, which revo I think it's fair to say it's revo revolutionized air transportation, probably the most fam famous aircraft ever, ever produced. Uh, it never, f never flew above 10,000 feet, non-pressurized cabin, but they were virtually indestructible. I think there's several hundred of them that are still operating today, uh, a lot probably in Latin America carrying drugs, but uh, they, they could land on very short uh, runways. 
Uh, introduced in DC-3, here's a picture of United Airlines DC-3, 21 seats, you know, two in one, and walk down the aisle. Uh, there were over 16,000 of these aircraft produced, and then an additional 10,000 C-47s, which were the military version uh, of, this, of the DC-3 with strengthened floor and cargo built. Uh, I also want to mention, in terms of the shortness of the war, this is a point that John Gant kind of Galbraith makes in the New Industrial Strait. Every single U.S. aircraft that saw major combat operations during the Second World War was already on the drawing books and completely designed at the time that the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. So the idea that the war, you know, kind of led to, there were some advances which came out of the war, but most of that kind of, uh, most of that was already in place by 41. So we, here we see Douglas being congratulated by Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, many lesser known, often unsung innovators improved products from the 1920s. So I want to talk about refrigeration. I think this came up sometime today. In the 1920s, mechanical refrigerators were an expensive, trouble-prone boutique product produced by small companies and requiring extensive aftermarket surface. In 1929, I think it would be generous to say that 3% of households owned them. Uh, if you ask people, you know, did they have refrigeration in their house, most people would say, yes, we have an icebox. And they literally meant they had an ice box. There is a huge industry in the United States that involved uh, cutting ice from Minnesota and Wisconsin lakes during the winter, storing it in insulated warehouses, shipping it down the Mississippi during the summer. I could never understand as an economic historian when I was reading these stories about the plantation south in the 1850s. And these plantation owners sitting around, you know, 100% humidity, probably 110 degrees, and they're sipping cold mint Juleps. I said, how is this happening? Well, the ice had been cut during the winter and it was shipped down the Mississippi and they were having it. Anyway, mechanical refrigeration is, a, is like it's a bleeding edge product. You know, only the latest tech households had it at that time. So here's a picture of a 1920s refrigerator. During the 1930s, refrigerators became a commodity product. Design, reliability, and functionality improved and their price dropped. Also, what had to happen was, uh, it's true, we had a huge building boom in the 1920s, and most of those houses were electrified, but what electrification in the 1920s meant for a household is there's one ceiling outlet for, a, for an incandescent bulb, and then one utility outlet in the, in the wall without a lot of uh, amperage to it. So you know, it could support a radio maybe, or a, you know, a floor lamp, but not a washing machine or electric range, or a refrigerator. The houses had to be upgraded and rewired, and so a lot of that was done during the 30s. So here's a pic picture of a production line during the 1930s of refrigerators. Uh, you, you know, they're using methods similar to those which had been used in the automobile industry. Here's a picture of a 1941 GE refrigerator. It doesn't have the no frost feature, but you can see it bears much closer resemblance to what we, uh, what we use today. It's not fair because I've got this one in color because it may be. Okay, so by, I said compare 3% penetration in 1929 with 44% penetration by 1940. This is, you know, the worst macroeconomic period of the, of, 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 of the 20th century. 56%, more than one out of every two households, urban households, has mechanical refrigeration. 39% of rural non-farm and even 15% of farm households, thanks in part to Roosevelt's Rural Electrification Initiative. So this diffusion of a new appliance, labor-saving appliance, is one manifestation of the fact that if you kept your job during the Depression, and that's a big if, if you kept your job, your real, that is inflation-adjusted or deflation-adjusted, your real hourly wages went up and quite substantially. If you kept your job, your real standard of living improved at a rate at least equal to what happened in the post-war period. But the problem, of course, was there were a lot of people who didn't lose their job and didn't get a job for a long time. So, you, you know, as again, it goes back to that poster in terms of are you looking at the top half or are you looking at the bottom half? And I mentioned before that uh, automobiles, you know, because of the Depression and the war, auto production didn't retain its 1929 peak until 1949. Never the, and registrations grew explosively in the 1920s. Uh, uh, more than tripling from uh, 8 million to about 27 million. Still, in the next 12 years, registrations grew by an additional 12 million registrations, and a lot of the cars produced in the 20s wore out, so they had to be replaced. 
So the bottom line is, that, as I say, by 36, we're talking about automobile production back up to 95% of where it was in 1929, and the cars were better. Here's a picture of a 1929 DeSoto. Uh, you can see that the headlights are not integrated into the car. The trunk you know, just pulls out at the back. Um, here's a 1941 Plymouth and 1941 Buick. Uh, the tires also have moved entirely away from the high-pressure tires which reflected the origin of this industry, of this product in the bicycle industry. You know, if you have a racing bike, you're going to pressurize your tires to 60 pounds per square inch. Your car tires are softer riding and typically, you know, 25 to 32 pounds. So you get softer riding cars. Uh, so the low-pressure balloon tires had almost completely replaced the high-pressure hard-riding tires. Most cars now had heaters and radios as standard equipment, uh, four-wheel hydraulic brakes, uh, which a big safety feature, aero aerodynamic design, integrated trunk, headlights, and there were many new options, most of those we take for granted today. Automatic transmission, power steering, front-wheel drive, V8 engine, all of these introduced during the 1930s. Indeed, some historians of the automobile industry will say the 1930s is the last decade in which we saw truly significant innovation in the internal combustion vehicle. And not product, but process instrumentation. I'm going to skip through some of this because it gets into industrial engineering, but there's many kind of much less heralded innovations involving instrumentation and insulation, thermal efficiency, capturing waste gas from blast furnaces and using it to, you know, recycling the heat so you don't lose as much, uh, monetizing industrial waste products, you know, industrial excrement, they find a use for it and they monetize that, that's tremendous efficiency. New materials, the use of metal alloys and plastics, which uh, wear out much uh, less uh, frequently. And then the tail end of the gains from electrifying the internal distribution of power within factories. Four-fifths of the total factor productivity growth in the 1920s, which was still pretty strong, but not as strong as the 30s, came out of manufacturing, and what it had to do with was with the replacement of the old methods for distributing power within the factory. The 19th century factory, whether it was driven by a water wheel, a steam engine, or even by the end of the century an electrical electric engine, had a large flywheel and then a big leather, uh, leather belt that transmitted the power mechanically to the factory and then through a system of shafts and gears and belts you would have these you know, horizontal shafts running down the ceiling of the factory, and then you'd have another belt, you know, which you'd loop over the end of the spindle of the lathe or whatever. So either the whole factory had to be running or it had to be turned off. And the other thing is that I never could understood, stand before doing this work, I couldn't understand why 19th century factories were four or five stories tall. You go to Lowell or Lawrence or Manchester, New Hampshire, the birth of the textile industries, 1820s, 30s, these are greenfield sites, land is dirt cheap. They're building four or five stories tall. It's always taller to do that than build, more expensive to do that than a single storied factory. Why? Because it's an engineering solution to reducing the efficiency losses associated with trying to transmit power. You're trying to minimize the sum of runs from the central power source. What they discover finally, even though Edison starts selling power to residential households in New York in 1882, it takes them a while, it takes innovation and small electric motors to realize they can rip out those overhead shafts, and they can put in wiring and small individual electric motors to drive the workstations. And it has huge efficiency gains because in the old days you had prime real estate right under the shaft, okay? But the stuff on the sides is basically dead space. It's not useful for much other than storage. Now they can use the whole floor. They can reconfigure it. And the typical 20th century factory is one or two stories tall with skylights, with essentially overhead gantries that they can move, you know, moving cranes on and so on. So there's unbelievable gains in efficiency in manufacturing in the 20s, which, you know, we've never had any, we had 5% TFP growth in the sector for a decade. We've never seen anything like it since. So it drops during the 30s, but to a rate of product, productivity growth in manufacturing, which is world class by any standard of comparison other than the 20s, and part of it is the tail end of this electrification process. You know, about two thirds has been completed by 1929. You get the tail end of it in the 30s. Okay, so I'm gonna skip over some of these details of industrial engineering and the scale economies in terms of big, building bigger boilers and bigger locomotives. Uh, chemistry, uh, one thing I'll mention, uh, quick drying lacquers. 
Um, you know, in the 1920s, a lot of the pro process of producing an automobile, you remember Henry Ford says you can have any color you want so long as it's black? Well, a lot of the process of producing that vehicle was literally watching paint dry. After the car was produced and painted, it had to sit in a drying shed for three weeks. So the chemical innovations that produce quick drying lacquers obviously have a very substantial impact on inventory turn and the cost of carrying inventory. So just an example, but I'm going to have to, you know, tongues, tents, carbide uh, blades, uh, uh, replacing carbon steel, a lot of work on alloys and so on and so forth, substituting plastics for wood or metal par parts. Uh, new chemical treatments of wood Railroad ties means they don't have to be ripped out and replaced every eight years. You can let them run for 20. Probably toxic as heck, but, you know, anyway. All right, so I'll, these are just some examples of some of the gains, you know, actual gains re registered when they ripped out those overhead shafts and reorganized the factory floor. They can, you know, take, put four floors onto, you know, do the same thing they were doing on four floors on one. All right, insulation, instrumentation. I'm going to skip over some of this. If you're really interested, you could go buy the book. It's $22.50 on Amazon paperback. It's also available in Kindle. All right, final thing. I did actually already talk about Tributary 3 in terms of the reorganization of railroads. So I do want to talk about, this is the last one I'll talk about, which, again, depending on your politics, you can, if you really love, you know, private sector and markets, you can look at all the wonderful things DuPont and General Electric were doing in terms of the privately funded research and development system. But if you believe that government can perform a valuable role, then you'll want to pay attention to this part of the presentation. And uh, there, the, again, the emphasis is on spillovers from the build out of the surface road network, as well as bridge tunnels and tunnels, uh, led to big product productivity gains in trucking, railroads, and wholesale and retail distribution. Trucking and railroads, though competitors, developed symbiotically. The problem with railroads is that they could not take the product the final mile, particularly in terms of distributing products to rural households, because, or at least except for a few months during the summer. So what happened during the summer when Montgomery Wards and Sears were shipping massive quantities of stuff, it was there was excess demand for freight car capacity. Then during eight months of the year, they had all these surplus freight cars, you know, sitting around. So there's a, you know, there's a big problem in terms of peak load utilization. So the, tra the railroads welcomed trucking because they thought trucking would take care of that final mile, and uh, that would be they would be like they would be like Siamese twins. This would be the language they used, but the railroads would be in the dominant position. That's how they saw it. They didn't appreciate that trucking would advance so quickly that it would begin to eat its eat the railroads' lunch in many of these markets. Uh, but anyway, just let me talk about productivity gains in railroads, which was again uh, partly uh, the result of the build out of the surface road network. Between 1929 and 1941, looking at the entire U.S. rail industry, the number of employees, the number of locomotives, and the number of rolling stock all declined by a fourth or a third. But revenue freight ton miles rose by 6% comparing 1941 with 1929, and passenger to miles declined only 5%. So for practical purposes, just in terms of thinking about productivity, we're producing about the same amount of output in 1941 with substantially fewer inputs. And that's a very concrete manifestation of productivity improvement. Again, the principal contribution there, it's not additions to the capital stock there, they're rationalizing it, but rather the unlimited freight interchange that uh, has come about as a result of the kick in the rear of adversity. I mean, by 1935, railroads responsible for a third of the track, first track miles in the country are in receivership. So they can't solve their problems as they did in the 20s by throwing money at them. Okay, let me talk now about the surface infrastructure. This will be close to my final topic. All right, car and part, you know, Henry Ford said, you know, you can have any you know, any color you want so long as it's black. And we've all heard the stories about how year after year, he, the price of a Model T and then a Model A dropped, even though he was paying premium wages, the $5 a day wage and so on. Okay. And so car and truck production in the 1920s had outrun improvements in the surface road infrastructure. Uh, there was a large political coalition in favor of better roads in the United States. Just to give you an example of how bad roads were in the United States, American farmers complained that they paid a mud tax compared to the French farmers because the French farmers could carry their grain over good roads at roughly half the cost per ton mile. 
And, you know, the situation in the U.S. is that basically once you got away from San Francisco, L.A., Chicago, and the Boston-Washington corridor, the roads simply weren't paved, which meant they were largely impassable during mud and snow season. There's a famous story about a, uh, uh, somebody, there was a society columnist, etiquette columnist called Emily Post, who wrote for a New York newspaper, and somebody uh, wrote into her, and this was 1915, and said that they were considering taking a transatlantic automobile trip. And uh, the, the, the writer, you know, the person writing in said, well, do you have any suggestions as to what route we should take? She replied with two words, Union Pacific. Okay. So you've got, the, you've got everybody, wants, everybody wants better roads. The farmers want them, the bicyclists want them, the motel industry wants them, the automobile industry wants them, the railroad wants them, the truckers want them, the people who are supplying the automobile industry, the copper, the glass. You can go on and everybody thinks it'd be a great idea. But in terms of the construction of a US system of national routes, the location of those roads will make some communities and break others. If the federal highway goes through your community, land values will go up, your town will boom, everybody will be stopping to get their cars fixed and get gasoline and get food. But if it bypasses your town, it will die. The same issues came up in the location of the interstate highway system or BART, the BART system in California. So these are political issues and plus the federal government has to deal with you know, the many state highway departments who will also be responsible for construction. So it's like, it's a, it's, I, you know, it's clearly you're going to have a bigger pie if you can resolve this, but it's not an easy matter just to snap your fingers and get an agreement on where these roads will be physically located. By November of 1926, the battles about the location of the U.S. route system have been resolved. And the uh, national government publishes a large map, which I'll show you in a moment, which shows the location of all the U.S. route systems. Now, U.S. route systems are the, the, the roads with the with the black and white shield, the famous Route 66. In California, the main highway near my house is US 101, not the interstates with the red, white, and blue shields. That started in 1956. But in terms of my growing up, I couldn't stand the US route system. You know, I, I, we had a summer place in New Hampshire. When I was a little kid, it took us almost four hours to get there. I couldn't wait for each segment of the interstate to open because you know, there weren't stoplights. You didn't get stuck in Chelmsford, Massachusetts for hours. Okay, but what I didn't appreciate then was what a huge improvement over what had existed before that U.S. route system represented. And it was, they started building, you know, in 1927, and except for a short dip in 1933 and 1934 and 1935, if you look at the statistics on street and highway construction, you would never know that there was a depression. So they kept on building, and by 1941, that system is complete. Construction stops except for you know, military installations and feeder roads during the war, but that's part of what I'm talking about in terms of the infrastructure necessary for post-war prosperity is in place in 1941. It's also a great age of bridge and tunnel construction. You have the Golden Gate Bridge, the Oakland Bay Bridge, George Washington Bridge, the Lincoln Tunnel, uh, the last major suspension bridge built in the United States was the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, which was completed in 1964. Now, I have to be careful. I'm not suggesting that we could have continued to get huge productivity gains had we continued to build uh, suspension bridges. We do have this principle in economics about diminishing returns, and obviously uh, the most uh, important uh, gaps had been, had been, had been bridged. Uh, but the other thing is just in terms of um, the other thing that was happening in the 40s was essentially experimentation and the principles involving controlled access highways, the freeways were being developed. The Pennsylvania Turnpike, I think opened in 1940. The Pasadena Freeway were examples of this. In New York State, they built the Merritt Parkway. So some of the kind of the blueprints for the post-war period were also being developed. So you can't really see this very well, but this is the November 1926 map. Uh, if you were able to actually see this, this would be US 101 running down the coast here. Uh, US-1, you know, ran down the eastern seaboard. As you remember from the song, Route 66 ran from Chicago to LA and so forth, you know, 2,000 miles all the way, et cetera, uh, et cetera. And some of you may have your favorite. Lewis was telling me about his, some of his favorite uh, US routes around here. So this was a tremendous uh, improvement. Here's construction of the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Pennsylvania Turnpike opened here in 1940. Pasadena Freeway in 1940. The Golden Gate Bridge being built, it was completed in 1936. 
Uh, another picture of the Golden Gate Bridge, just celebrated its 75th anniversary. This is the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge, also opened in that period, also having recently celebrated its 75th anniversary with some new spans designed to strengthen it against uh, earthquake, potential earthquake damage. The George Washington Bridge, uh, bridging the Hudson in New York City. Lincoln Tunnel, opened here in December of 1937. And then, of course, we had Hydro too, Hoover Dam and the Columbia River system and all of that, which facilitated cheaper electricity. So I think what I'll do there is stop right now so we have some time for questions. I did start at the top of the talk at the beginning about railroads. So it is those the combination of those three tributaries, a still very strong growth of total factor productivity and manufacture driven by TFP, the spillovers from the build out of the surface road network and the bridges and tunnels, and the um, uh, the effect on some sectors like railroads. Actually, I'll tell one final vignette. I know I, I just can't resist. Let me see if I can, I can find this. Okay, I want to fast forward to 1964, 65. This is a quarter century after that first, uh, the first New York World's Fair. There's another one, a quarter century later. General Motors aims to replicate its success and have the most popular exhibit. This is one I actually saw. You know, I'm old, but I did not see the 1939 uh, 40 World's Fair. Okay, older. Okay, a new Futurama. So I went to that and I was not bowled over. What you saw there in 1965 were moving dioramas of the exploitation of the moon, the Amazon, the Antarctic, the seabed, and the deserts. Every single one of these seemed to have a huge piece of earth moving equipment, presumably manufactured by General Motors, uh, as well as a brief homage to the city of tomorrow. Two points about that exhibit. Number one, it did not succeed in capturing the imagination of visitors. And number two, its record of forecasting the future was much, much worse. Almost none of what it suggested has come to pass as compared to what people were so excited about in 1940. Okay. Uh, and so why? Well, this is my cultural explanation, is that living standard improvement during the golden age Although as rapid as during the Depression was less revolutionary, the forecasts seemed less gripping and less realistic. We now know that they were, uh, and so on and so forth. Oh, sorry, this is the final. I promise, this is it. <laughs> Disneyland. How many people have been to Disneyland? Anybody? Okay. Well, Dis Disney was very much influenced by the spirit of the World's Fairs, particularly the 1933 Century of Progress exhibit in Chicago. And he wanted to capture and distill that experience of that feeling of excitement capture, distill, and commercialize that. Uh, and that's what he tried to do in 1955 in, uh, in, in, in Disneyland. There were four areas of Disneyland. Tomorrowland, which had the one-stage TWA rocket. So nobody will remember TWA. It was a defunct airline that American bought. Uh, it was initially the most popular, but by the 1990s, the area was a bit down at its heels. And so the Imagineers tried to recapture the enthusiasm for progress even in 1939-40 or in 1955 when the park opened. They pulled out their hair or what hair they had left. They couldn't do it. So instead, what did they do? They developed a retro Tomorrowland, replete with 1930s Buck Rogers imagery and color schemes. I'm not kidding. And then off in a little side exhibit in a sector they called Innoventions, they have cell phones and IT devices, which we know were the most rapidly changing, uh, evolving devices. But uh, I guess my sense is, first of all, IT innovation has indeed changed our lives. But technological and organizational progress in the last 15 years had affected a relatively narrower portion of the economy than was true during the, de than the Depression, and advance was broader with greater overall impact during our great leap forward in the 30s. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. There's so much to talk about that uh, I'm not quite sure where to start, so I thought what I would do is just get things kicked off here a little bit, and then we have microphones out. Jake's got one, and uh, I'm, I'm clutching Mike, thank you. <laughs> it's been a long day. Um, so I'll start out with a question or two, and then open it up. Um, first one, you, you alluded to the current situation a number of times. You're very deft about not addressing it, so I gotta pull you back and uh, kind, of, kind of make you do a little bit of that. So. Um, what lessons have we either ignored or not learned from what you talked about tonight that we need to maybe be implementing today? Um, okay, I think one thing, let's, let's turn on. 
I think one lesson from, I said, you know, one lesson from the Great Depression, I think, is that uh, well-chosen government infrastructure can play an important role in increasing the potential output of the economy over time. We act, the government actually spent about as much money during the Depression on infrastructure as it did on machine tools for the Defense Plan, Defense Plan Corporation and during the war, but a lot of that, you know, really did not have a beneficial effect. It was under wartime circumstances. So I think under the current situation, I mean, you have to understand that government spending can have a, an important effect on the aggregate demand side and on the aggregate supply side. Most of the research on government spending to date, and before my book, on government spending goes, goes back to exploring, you know, whether we really had much Keynesian economics during the 1930s. And a, a professor at MIT named E. Carey Brown wrote a famous article in 1956 in which he said that, you know, it's not that Keynesian economics failed during the Great Depression, he says it wasn't tried. And what he means by that is that the increase in government spending on streets, highways, tunnels, bridges, and hydro was much too small to compensate for the collapse of gross private domestic investment, which is private sector spending on plant and equipment. And as you saw, it plummeted uh, three quarters between 1929 and 1933. So I'm in no way disputing that. But what I am saying is that what has been overlooked is the effect of government infrastructure spending on the growth of potential output through its beneficial impact on productivity growth in trucking, railroads, and wholesale and retail distribution. In our current situation, uh, we have a, it's, you know, people, again, the, the National Bureau says that the recession ended in 2009. So that's already, my gosh, it's almost four or five years ago. We've had a very slow recovery. And so though the economy is growing, we remain very substantially below potential output. And the other thing you have to appreciate is that the Congressional Budget Office cranked down its estimates of the trajectory of potential uh, you know, after the beginning of the recession because of the deleterious effect on worker skills, among other things, of the being long-term unemployed. So there's still, re however you measure it, there's still a large output gap. That output gap could be closed where the politics uh, somewhat different with an American Recovery and Reinvestment Act uh, that we repeated. That was basically over in 2011, or that had been twice as large as it was. And I could go into the politics of why it ended up the size it did. It's not going to happen so long as we have the current political configuration. Any type of government spending would close the gap. Ideally, we would be doing that spending on, you know, fixing bridges in Minnesota and, you know, potholes and repaving and conducting well-chosen government infrastructure. And I think the 1930 shows that with, you know, technocratically minded engineers kind of figuring out where these highways were supposed to be, obviously there must have been some pork barrel and log rolling that was going on there, but that this can have a significant and beneficial and persisting effect on the long run output of the economy and on the standard of living. And the idea that there's not, the government can't do anything right that's just inherent in government and the private sector you know, can do no wrong, I think you know, that's, uh, that's an important lesson that we need to revisit. So just following up on that, and then I'll open it up to the floor. Um, is one way to characterize what you're, what you're saying is we really ought to be paying more attention to potential than just the output gap. We get obsessed with the output gap and clearly it's important. There's people's lives at stake and, yeah. and everything. But we forget about that long run potential. In a sense, the standard of living of our children and our grandchildren is just as much at stake as our own. Right. Is that another way to characterize well, what it, you're getting it at? It is, obviously, particularly for those people, the long term unemployed, and we have a very large number, of, very large number of the people who are officially unemployed have been unemployed for more than 15 weeks. So there's a tremendous loss, obviously, experienced by those, those families at tremendous cost. Uh, and that's, that's, that's really terrible. Um, ideally, we should be closing that gap, uh, but you know, it, it could be because of another war. That does not generally increase the potential output of either our economy or Iraq's economy, for that matter. Uh, or you know, we could be thinking about ways to spend this money productively in a way that would, uh, would, benefit, would benefit the private sector ultimately as well. Uh, and again, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act had some of that. It also had a lot of aid to state governments, which, unlike the federal government, are generally constitutionally prohibited from running deficits and thus are forced to cut all sorts of public service jobs whenever their tax revenues you know, go, into the, 
go, go, go through the floor during, during a recession. Um, and I think we should have had more of that. I think the economy could still benefit from that. And frankly, a lot of it would be self-financing so long as we're still below potential because the stimulus to the economy would produce a flow of tax revenues, not enough to cover the full spending, but a, a significant portion would be self-financing in that sense. We would not face the problem of crowding out in terms of the necessity of skyrocketing real interest rates, which would essentially reduce the incentive for the private sector to invest. We've still got very substantial slack in the economy. So that's, again, it's not, the depression is not a success story. It's very clear that the, on the aggregate demand side, I'm, you know, whatever I'm saying about the Great Depression and about the war years, which I actually think were retardative, slowed down the growth rate of potential from what had been experienced during the Depression. But there's no question that massive fiscal and monetary stimulus, you know, brought the economy to over full employment in a very short time. So it, it did that. It just was not beneficial on the uh, potential output side. Whereas in the Depression, the government spending was far too small to close the output gap. But on the other hand, uh, my research suggests had very beneficial effects in terms of the growth of potential out. But again, hard to keep all this stuff straight. Yeah. I've monopolized your time way too much, Jake. Uh, Mike, are there questions from the audience? Raise your hand and they'll get a microphone to you. Kind of going off that, I was just wondering how you think we get to that point, because you were kind of talking about, like, with the, the government and the cur current political system, it's not happening. So how would you say we could get to that point where we spend the correct amount of money on the correct amount of things? Well, you're going to get me into politics rather than economics right now. Uh, I mean, I think... <laughs> He's uh, trying to do that to you. Yeah, well, all right. I mean, one of our political parties um, is, you know, obsessed with deficit spending and obsessed with not raising taxes. So you've got, a, you've got a problem, and obsessed, if they're reasonable and moderate, with challenges from the right. So you know, there's always a group of people in this country who are demanding that the federal government be as hamstrung as the state governments in terms of running deficits. They want a balanced budget multiplier. They want balanced budgets not just over the business cycle, which isn't such a bad idea from my perspective, run surpluses as we did in the late 90s when the economy is fully employed and deficits otherwise. They want a balanced budget every year, which essentially prohibits countercyclical fiscal policy. Probably need a constitutional amendment for that. We're not going to get that. But when these issues come up in Congress right now, uh, if the you know the, if the Democrats say, well, we'd like some infrastructural improvements, you know, Republicans will say pork barrel, pork barrel, and there will be some of that. But let's suppose some of them are well chosen. Okay, think about the it's going to it's going to widen the deficit because although. It won't be the full amount because you're going to get some benefit in terms of increased tax revenues coming in, but it's still going to, it's still going to widen the deficit. So uh, I think there's two responses to that is that one is that although the debt to GDP ratio in the United States has risen to about the 70% level, it's still substantially below where it was after the Second World War, it was over 100%. We're nowhere near the danger zone in terms of the debt to GDP ratio in, the, in, this, in this country. The second answer is if you don't like the deficits now, you got to raise taxes, and there's all sorts of things which you know. It, it's just unbelievable some of the stuff which which goes on. There is this you know carried interest exemption, for example, for the hedge fund industry, which allows these hedge fund uh, uh, managers to get most of their what is basically wage and salary income taxed at capital gains rates. You know, 15 percent. There's no justification for it, but obviously there's a very substantial. Uh, you know, interest group that wants to maintain it, which is contributing heavily to both parties. Um, so, yeah, and, and then you have any tax increase is not okay. And there's a certain inconsistency, as I was pointing out to some students, in terms of the position of the Republican Party here, because under Bush, Karl Rove engineered a very significant expansion of entitlements in this country. It's the prescription drug benefit under Medicare. Now, what happened in that was two things. Number one, the pharmaceutical industry got a free pass because there's a provision in that bill that prevents the government from negotiating volume discounts, even though the Veterans Administration is allowed to do it. So they're going to pay full, you know, it's all going to be full retail. And secondly, there's not a dime of additional tax revenue that's in that bill. So it just, it, it, you know, it's a huge expansion of entitlement, no concern with essentially providing additional tax revenues to fund it. When the American Recovery and Reinvestment, I'm sorry, the Affordable Care Act came along, 
Uh, Democrats tried to take this seriously. There are additional taxes. There's a there's a Medicare premium that you know after your income is above a certain level, you're gonna you're gonna have to pay additional Medicare taxes. There's a tax on medical devices, and you know there's some other there's some other additional tax revenues which over a 10-year period are actually likely to lessen the deficit. But you know you have people saying things that just you know you cannot have the additional infrastructure spending if you're demanding a balanced budget and you say we can't have any more taxes. It just it's that that is simple that is simple arithmetic. And I think as I was saying at lunch, one of the problems is that, you know, if you go to Washington, it seems to be common sense that the principles you would use in your own household in terms of dealing with a crisis are those you would use for the national government. In other words, you know, if you face a sudden loss of income, you don't sit around and say, well, we can just, you know, deficit spend our way out of this problem. <laughs> I mean, you have got to do something about your budget and cut your spending. That just seems common sense. People try to apply this to the national economy, and you know that's part what at least I try to teach in macro, and I so Lewis does as well. That's not necessarily so. So what seems obvious might not be. That's one reason to study economics. Other questions, please. Um, I just kind of wanted to talk a little bit about the um, government spillovers and yes. if there were any in the airline industry. You talked about major expansions in the manufacturing for airplanes right. in general. Right. Um, how did that affect the recovery in the Great Leap Forward and how could it potentially improve American growth in potential as we right. move forward? That's a very reasonable. I did have pictures of the DC-3 and I, you know, we can go back and watch Casablanca with the... <laughs> You know, Claude Rains and Humphrey Bogart and whatever. That's a DC-3, by the way, on the runway <laughs> shroud of the fog. Yep. Um, here's the thing about, about railroads. As I just said, you know, any period of technological innovation and exploitation, such as the 12-year period that I'm focusing on here, is going to involve, you know, three types of investment and exploitation of technological opportunities. Some, it's going to be essentially taking Abramovitz, who I knew at Stanford, used to talk about a larder. And, you know, there's a larder at the end of the 20s of unexploited technologies where the groundwork has been done. So, so for example, refrigeration using uh, electrical compressors, they basically know the technology. They just have to get the cost down. So some of what you're seeing in the 30s is exploitation of technologies, which are basically the groundwork. The research part of it has been done in the 20s. Part of it in the 30s is stuff where the research is done in the 30s and the beginning of the exploitation is done in the 30s. And then, as I was describing with respect to television, some is where the research is done in the 30s, but the principal exploitation is in the post-war period. And I would say that commercial aviation falls in that third category. In terms of the overall economy, yes, there's big improvements in productivity, but it is too small in terms of the proportion of value added that it contributes to make a major contribution to economy-wide technological advance. In terms of trying to figure out which sectors are contributing to the economy-wide sectoral advance, there's two numbers that matter. One number is how rapidly did productivity growth grow in that sector, but the second number is what fraction of the economy did it represent. And you can crudely kind of average the beginning and the end period averages. It's too small at that point. So it helped lay the foundation. And the other infrastructural part of it is a lot of what the WBPA did during the 30s was to build municipal airports. So that, that was essentially, again, laying groundwork, and it's, it, it helps explain the advances you know, that were going on in, in aviation, as well, of course, as the work that Douglas and other innovators were doing in aircraft design. Questions? Uh, I noticed a really interesting word you have on your presentation. You're saying um, if you keep your job, uh, your standard of living is uh, uh, increased at the rate that uh, kind of be before the depression period. No, uh, after, after. Uh, anyway, continue. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's like, I, I feel funny it's kind of in similar uh, situation right now. It's uh, right now, uh, as it suggests, like uh, we're still having really high uh, unemployment rate. It's like, I think it's 6.7 this, this February. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's above like 7% uh, for the whole last year. And uh, so it's uh, still like a huge gap between the actual output and the potential output. Yeah. But uh, it's like uh, I saw a study as I seen like for the unemployment rate of college student, it's always like around like two to three percent. It's yeah. basically like nothing. So basically means like every student sitting here or the uh, the faculty sitting here 
here, like we are keeping our job basically. So does that mean it seem, uh, similar to the uh, uh, area of the after depression, uh, depression period you, uh, you talk about in the presentation? Like uh, we are going to keep our job and our standard of living is going to increase at the same rate as uh, like uh, before the as before the uh, financial crisis. Yeah, well, that's a that's that's a good question. Clearly, uh, if you keep your job, you're going to be better off than if you're involuntarily unemployed. But uh, I guess what I what I'm trying to say is no. The standard of living, even if you keep your job, is not going to increase at the same rate it did during the Great Depression or the 48 to 73 period, and hasn't been increasing at that rate since the 1970s. In other words, what I'm saying is that the the long run rate of total factor productivity growth has been generally downward since the second and third quarter of the 20th century, with the exception of a somewhat upward blip between 1995 and 2003 or 2005. That's the IT boom. The facts of the matter is if you compare 1948 to 73, uh, family incomes overall were rising at 2.5% a year, partly because of a still healthy rate of total factor productivity growth, and partly because of the resumption of physical capital accumulation after the war, unimpeded by the depression and the demands of the war. So we had very strong growth in standard of living and also relatively fuller employment between 1948 to 73. And what's interesting about that period is that the gains from that growth on the income side were more or less uniformly distributed across the quintiles of the income distribution with actually a slight bias towards the bottom. So you had a high rate of product, labor productivity growth fueled by those two factors, and everybody is benefiting from it with a slight bias for the bot from the bottom. If you then look from 1973 onward, there's a, it's not that our standard of living has been dropping in terms of average terms. No, it has been increasing, and it will continue to increase, but it has been increasing at a slower rate. And what's different about the period after 1973 is that on the income side, almost all of the gains have gone to the top 1%, and within the top 1%, the top one-tenth of 1%. So that's, that's the difference. So your answer, are you going to be better off if you keep your job? Yes, you're going to be better off if you keep your job. But we have, we have you know, a real growing problem of both income and wealth inequality in this country which has returned us to a situation comparable to what Piketty and Say suggest prevailed during the 1920s. And so it's a very different world from the world in which I grew up, in which number one, standard of living was growing more rapidly, and number two, the gains were being uniformly, more or less uniformly distributed. But with that, thank you so much for joining us here at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University.